Right. Hello and welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our Child Health and Wellbeing Network webinar, which focuses on paediatric asthma and is aimed at primary care colleagues. Um, our proposal is for this session to be recorded, um, so just for, to let you know. A few points of housekeeping which might be helpful. If you could please stay on mute and turn your microphone off and camera off throughout the session unless you're actively taking part in any conversations. Um, we, we plan to be in a sort of sizable group today, so that helps with bandwidth. Um, it would be really, really helpful if our colleagues could list in the chat the practice and area that they represent, just so that we can have a sense of um, reach for this session. Um, do feel free to use the chat facility and to raise your hands to enable us to facilitate conversation. Please note that we plan to share this um, with the colleagues who've attended today and also any other co contacts who express an interest in receiving this information. So it's really important to remind colleagues about confidentiality when discussing practical application. Um, our colleagues from the Asthma Leadership Group uh, will respond to the chat function throughout, but we will be having dis opportunities for interactive discussion throughout the session. Any questions that remain unanswered, um, we will attempt to respond to um, following the session and also we'll continue to monitor this chat for a period of about 24 hours to allow people the opportunity if they think of something following the event. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, my name's Louise Dauncey. I'm a network de de delivery manager for the Child Health and Wellbeing Network, and I'm here on behalf of the North East and North Cumbria ICS Asthma Leadership Group. Dr Moss, our clinical lead, and Dr Ramphal, one of our clinical advisors, will lead the sessions with presentations and discussion, and both will introduce themselves formally as part of their presentations. Um, the list included on the... Oh, what's happening to the slides? The list that's included on the slides here um, and provide the names. I've got back to the slides. Sorry. That's it. So the yeah. slide that I was referring to just displays a list of our other um, members of the asthma leadership group. And within that, we've got a range of colleagues um, who represent a range of disciplines, including respiratory nurse specialists and 0 to 19 school nurses and pharmacists. So we're a wide range of disciplines. Um, so next slide is the proposed agenda. So I've laid here out um, the suggested agenda and as mentioned, colleagues will respond to the questions within the chat um, and we will use the discussion time to enable further conversation. Um, we have three sessions planned which will cover diagnosis and management, wheezing in preschool children and then a final session on hot topics and tips. We'll try to keep to time, but if we look like we're running over, we will postpone the conversation to sessions to the to the to the very end, and we'll pick up those conversations um, after Dr. Ramphal's um, session. Next slide, please. My name's Louise Dauncey, and I just wanted to provide an overview of the Child Health and Wellbeing Network and my role within it. I'm a network delivery manager with main responsibility around the children and young persons transformation agenda. Next slide, please. So without spending a lot of time on this, I just wanted to provide a bit of an overview and background around the Child Health and Wellbeing Network, just to describe briefly the evolution of the network, the mandate and systems are, system asks and our priorities and where we are today. Oh, we've lost the slides. In 2018 and 2019, we undertook a series of engagement activities across the system. We had over a thousand points of contact um, from the education, health and social care sector. Um, part of this engagement included children, young people and families, and we currently have in excess of 1600 members to our network. Ultimately, our mandate is about connections, sharing good practice and driving quality improvements. Next slide, please, Carol. So the image here um, is our priority wheel. This um, corresponds with the findings and feedback from the engagement we undertook in 2019. You'll see here there are nine priorities that were identified, and this won't be new to these your to colleagues <coughs> in recognition of our um, local area, our socioeconomic challenges. And obviously you'll be aware that this aligns with the National Core 20 and more locally, our Northeast and North Cumbria um, um, interpretation of the Core 20 plus 5 framework. <coughs> 
In 2021, we undertook some validation to check with the system about whether or not these priorities were still pressing and they were agreed that they were, so they were validated in that sense. But a new priority area was identified, which was family support, and this was highlighted to be lacking and an area of priority. Next slide, please. So ultimately, um, who we are and what we do, broadly speaking, we're a platform that enables collaboration and connections um, to allow stakeholders across the system to work together to make a difference for young people and their families. Our vision is that that working together will advantage children and young people and allow them opportunities to flourish and to reach their potential, unblocking those barriers that might that might present. Next slide, please. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just to provide a bit of a summary and to, to reflect really on um, the, the organisation structural changes that are happening around us, which have um, led to the work around the Children and Young Persons Transformation Agenda. The first map on the left um, shows the, the boundaries of the 42 statutory ICSs. You'll see there that the North East and North Cumbria is at the top, mark number two. The second map um, on the right hand side shows the four local area integrated care partnerships. Um, these outline um, the geographic boundary areas and also mark out the 13 local authority boundary areas that they fall within. Um, you'll appreciate that the structure of the NHS organisations has changed since the beginning of July 22, um, where the existing, the existing responsibilities for commissioning services have historically sat with the CCGs. Obviously, this is now transferred to the Integrated Care Board. The Integrated Care Board operates across wide geography and diverse population with wide ranging socioeconomic challenges. And obviously you'll be aware of the Core 20 framework and the recognition of asthma as a clinical area of additional vulnerability. Within our footprint, we work across eight acute NHS foundation trusts, two mental health trusts, three ambulance trusts, and in the region of about 560 GP practices. Also appreciating the, the, the audience today, you'll be aware that the face of primary care has changed with it, with the evolution of primary care networks. And over the last 24 months, there's been a move towards um, widening uh, community services to provide a broad range of services at community level. In consideration of the ICS, we work with 13 local authorities, 13 local education authorities and public health authorities and a whopping 1400 educational settings. Next slide, please. I won't go into much detail again, I appreciate time is of the essence. This slide just shows the range and work, range and components of our work within the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. We have a diverse range of different types of projects and lead on the delivery of the Children and Young Persons Transformation Programme, as well as <clears throat> the Integration Centre. So myself and Laura lead on those areas. You'll recognise um, the other um, areas included with the Integration Centre, including Healthy Together, Social Prescribing and the work around integrated settings. Um, we also have some really innovative and unusual projects, such as the South Tees Arts Project. More detail is available on our website. Next slide, please. So just to frame the work, um, the long term plan sets out a future vision for the NHS. Children and Young Persons Transformation is a credible plan for the redesign of children and young persons services, hence transformation. In, the intention will be for clinical networks to be rolled out to improve the quality of care for children and young people with long term conditions such as asthma, epilepsy and diabetes. And this will largely be achieved through sharing best practice, integrating services and the promotion and encouragement facilitation of bespoke quality improvement projects. Currently, the Child Health and Wellbeing Network is hosted by NHS England in the capacity with the same mandate as a clinical network. Next slide, please. So this just highlights the priority areas of work in respect of the Children and Young Persons Transformation Programme. Largely and loosely speaking, it's about the integration of services, improving the quality of care and experience for children, young people and their families, and the more ready and active involvement of children in the design and um, implementation of, of procedural change. There are 10 areas of priority, and you'll see there that one of which is dedicated specifically um, to the rollout and, and implementation of, of the National Asthma Care Bundle. So that's it from me regarding the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. I'd encourage you to look at our website and find out more about the various projects. If you aren't a member, I would encourage you to sign up and become a member. And we provide all sorts of information on a weekly basis and provide opportunity for all sorts of discussion. Um, I'll hand now to Dr. Ramphal to lead the first session on paediatric asthma diagnosis and management.
Thanks, Louise. So my name is Nilmani Ramphal. I'm a consultant paediatrician at the QE. And as Louise has mentioned, um, I also work as a clinical advisor for um, the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. don't think the slides are moving for me. I don't know whether they're moving for anybody else. No, they're not moving for us either. Try again. Yes, yeah, so as Louise has mentioned, we are part of a bigger group and we've recently been joined by pharmacy colleagues who have expanded our team. Next slide, please. So we hope in the next 15 to 20 minutes um, to talk a little bit about what asthma is, diagnosis, management options in primary care, and I hope to wrap up with a case study of a patient who I've seen recently. Next, please. You will all be aware that asthma is a very common condition, particularly in children. So we have 5.4 million people who suffer from asthma in the UK, 1.1 million of them are children. And that sadly, outcomes for children in the UK are among the worst in the West. And it's um, and the outcomes for the children in the Northeast are also among the worst in the UK, um, which therefore um, you know, highlights why we are very keen um, on this work and, and we would be very keen to change that. Next slide. So the World Health Organization definition of asthma is that it is a long term condition that affects children and adults. The air passages in the lungs become narrow due to inflammation and tightening of the muscles around the small airways. This causes asthma symptoms such as cough, we shortness of breath and chest tightness. Next slide, please. And, um, you know, if you were to kind of look at it, um, the previous slide, please. Yeah, you can see there that there is a nice normal airway where it's nice and patent and air can flow in and out nicely. In a person who has asthma that is swollen and, and the muscles are tight, and if they have an acute um, attack, then that becomes even more swollen and tighter. And sometimes there will be an element of mucus plugging as well, which may lead to further obstruction. Next, please. <laughs> So when would we suspect a diagnosis of asthma? You probably know this more than us, that cough and wheeze are very common symptoms in children. And sometimes it is difficult to pick which of these children will have asthma and which ones won't. Um, whilst as professionals, you will all be very familiar what wheeze is and that it is a continuous high pitched musical sound that's coming from the chest. Often parents will, dis will use the term wheeze to describe a variety of no noises. So it is important to establish whether parents are actually describing a wheeze when they're talking about wheeze when, um, when we see them. Most of the information from this slide is taken from the BTS guidelines um, and they quote that um, about a quarter of children who cough or wheeze or have exercise induced symptoms will have asthma. But most children who have asthma will have cough and wheeze. So if they have a cluster of symptoms, they have cough, shortness of breath, wheeze, chest tightness, exercise induced symptoms, then they are more likely to have asthma. And if that wheeze has been heard by health professional on auscultation, then that again increases the probability that you're dealing with asthma. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of history, I can't stress this enough that there is no substitute for a good history and that is vital in making the diagnosis when it comes to children and young people. Uh, we want to be exploring symptoms. We want to know when their symptoms are worse. There will be an element of diurnal variation and often they will report that their symptoms are worse either first thing in the morning 
or um, in the evening or overnight. We want to know what their triggers are. Do they have allergic and non-allergic triggers? How frequently they're getting symptoms and how severe those symptoms are. So if they've been admitted to hospitals, what kind of treatment they've required? Have they required any IV medication, for example, or have they been to um, intensive care for any of their admissions? We want to know how often they're presenting um, unplanned. So whether they so they may be coming to see us, but then they may be accessing care for different routes. Um, so they may go to urgent care, they may go to A&E, they may get to the GP from um, from time to time. So all those on schedule attendances often give us the, the wider picture and, and um, gives us a, a better idea of how um, poorly the, the, the disease might be controlled. Um, we want to know which medication helps. We also want to know how often they miss medication. And I ask as a matter of routine when I see um, children and young people who can give me a history how often they miss their medication. And often um, you will see the parent's face kind of drop in the consultation when the young person admits that they are not taking it. And for me, that makes my job easier because it means that all I have to do is to try and get them to get the medication rather than escalate um, with more medication. Um, but more often than not, they're not taking their medication all the time. And we all know that when we have medication, you know, we all miss from time to time. Um, if they have a spacer, then we want to know whether they're using it. Um, many of them, again, will not have a spacer. We'll admit that they use the inhalers directly in their mouth and they should be using a spacer. We want to know what the impact is on the quality of life, particularly on the education. And, and again, as you will know, that many young people lose time in education as a result of the asthma um, attacks. Many of these will have comorbidities such as eczema, allergies and allergic rhinitis. And increasingly now we are seeing um, um, children who are obese and that will have an impact as well on their disease and their ability and their long health overall. Next slide, please. So whilst you will recognize most of the allergic triggers on this slide, the one that um, I think it is extremely important that we ask about is whether they have a nut allergy or not. So if they have a nut allergy and they have asthma, then they are at high risk of anaphylaxis and that also then has to be dealt with. Next slide, please. And again, you will be um, more and more aware now that environmental triggers are very much recognized as exacerbating asthma. And sadly, many of us will remember this um, nine year old girl who died in the London area from an acute asthma attack. And for the first time in the UK, air pollution was put down as a cause of death for her. So next slide, please. And more recently, this uh, um, young um, child who died as a result of chronic exposure to mold, um, again, from respiratory illness. Next slide, please. We prob probably are much more familiar with cigarette smoking as, as, as a trigger. And um, whilst parents will go to length to explain to us how they smoke outside the house, so, you know, we, we have... Um, so I've had parents tell me that they put on a different coat, they go out, they wash their hands, you know, they've described elaborate routines of how they try and minimize the exposure to their children. We know that in the end, it doesn't really make a difference if parents are smokers and they are in a smoking environment that unfortunately they will be at increased risk of wheezing and it will make the asthma worse. So kind of driving that message that smoking is not just bad for the person who's smoking, but also um, for those who are around them. Next, please. On examination, often when we see them in the non-acute setting, again, we don't really find a, a huge amount. Um, if there is um, chronic um, poorly controlled disease, then sometimes we may find a hyper-expanded or barrel-shaped chest. Less commonly now, we will sometimes see a Harrison sulcus, which is essentially um, dipping underneath the rib cage as a result of the diaphragm working quite hard against chronic obstruction. Next slide, please. In terms of diagnosis, um, peak flow variability of about 20% will be suggestive of asthma. Although the NICE guidance does recommend that uh, we try spirometry in everyone who's five and above, in practice, 
many five-year-olds will not be able to achieve good readings on spirometry. And I would say if they're not managing to do a peak flow, then there is no point in trying um, spirometry. And also access to spirometry is not necessarily always available. Um, but if we have done spirometry, then uh, an improvement of at least 12% in FEV1 to either beta to agonist or corticosteroid treatment will be considered positive. The other thing to point out is that normal spirometry when they are asymptomatic, particularly in children and young people, does not exclude asthma. And um, while we have a cutoff of an FEV1 of uh, over FVC ratio of less than 70% is considered positive. The other thing to be aware of is often in young um, children in particular, the FEV1 to FVC ratio can be quite high, up to 90%. So for them to have to drop to 70% requires quite, quite um, an extent of disease, which therefore will not pick every asthmatic. And um, similarly, um, we often measure inflammatory markers and pheno of more than 35 is considered positive, but if they are on inhaled steroids, for example, again, the pheno might be normal. Next slide, please. So in terms of management, what are we aiming for? We are aiming that they don't have to use their SABA very often, so up to three times a week. Um, so, sorry, less than three times a week. So if they're using it three times and more, then that again would be an indication that um, they're, they're not as well controlled. Um, we want them not to have symptoms at night. We want them to be able to take part in all activities, not miss school, um, not to have to attend unplanned um, visits to, um, to health um, settings, so um, less uh, emergency presentation to A&E or to urgent care centres. Um, Importantly, we don't want them to be having repeated courses of oral steroids, which are obviously higher dose and have a lot um, more um, side effects. Yeah. And also we want to be able to empower the patients and families to recognize when to seek help and to access um, and to access good resources. So that's where the, you know, ha having a, a good personalized asthma action plan and signposting to good web-based resources um, comes in handy. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So medication that you will probably use um, um, or that some of them will be on when, when we see them, um, they will have a SABA as a reliever. Some of them will be on inhaled steroids, and inhaled steroids are particularly effective if there is a clear history of atopy. Some of them will be on combination inhalers, and I would say if you're having to add a long-acting beta to agonist, then it is much better to switch them to combination inhaler, as they're more likely to take one inhaler as opposed to two. It does work, work well, particularly if you're stepping up when exercise is a trigger. And whilst you will be more familiar with um, maintenance and uh, reliever therapy, um, but in adults, um, in children and young people, we wouldn't really use it until they are uh, above 12 and above. You could try and recept antagonists very widely used again. And um, sometimes I do wonder whether they work well because perhaps they are taking it as it is a medication that's easy to take rather than an inhaler. But in those people in whom it works well, it works really well. It doesn't work for everyone. So if when it's being tried, it's worth um, stressing to the family that, you know, um, try it for at least a month. And um, it can sometimes make the children more hyperactive. It can affect their sleep. Um, so important to warn them of, of those um, side effects. And if they're able to kind of tolerate it for a bit and see whether, whether it works, then that's worth it. Occasionally, the side effects are too troublesome and we have to stop because of that. But often when viral illnesses are a trigger, Montague gas will work quite well. And similarly, if there is um, coexisting troublesome allergic rhinitis, the leukotriene receptor antagonist often will, will also help work quite well. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
Hi, colleagues. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Ramphill. I think we have um, a bit of a challenge with the slides. I think what's happening is that some individuals might be taking control. So I wonder if Carol could just reassume control of the slides and then we can continue to progress through them. Thanks Thank all. You. Thank you. So um, we, we mentioned about comorbidities, important to treat those as well. And again, I would reiterate that, you know, if there is a nut allergy, it is important to identify that as they are at high risk of anaphylaxis. And if that's the case, then they need referral to an allergy service. They need um, two um, autoadrenaline injectors and, and uh, training on how to use them. And it's worth signposting them to um, websites like Allergy, allergy UK and beta anaphylaxis, which has been developed regionally and is now quite a um, well-used website. Next slide, please. In terms of resources for asthma, again, you know, we would encourage that you use the Beat Asthma website, which is a wealth of, of resources. Um, Louise mentioned about Healthier Together, I think, already, and uh, Again, it is linked to beat asthma and linked to um, several other pieces of work in relation to asthma. Um, there will be other national uh, websites that you are aware of. And what used to be Asthma UK is now combined with uh, the British Lung Foundation and is Asthma Lung UK. And um, they have good resources as well. And I certainly often use the itchy, sneezy, wheezy um, website because it covers the kind of umbrella of all other atopic diseases like eczema and uh, allergic rhinitis and we'll have very good videos for example on how to use um, um, a nasal spray which often again is, is uh, incorrectly used. Next slide please. So we as a group, we have worked with primary care to try and come to um, some guidance on how to, when to refer to secondary care. This piece of work was led um, by my colleague, Dr. Higab, who is also a, a clinical advisor and a consultant pediatrician who works at uh, James Cook. And uh, the link there would take you to, um, to that on the Healthier Together website. So just as a summary in the next slide, um, so those would be the criteria for referral. If they have persistent chronic symptoms, most days for more than three months, worsening symptoms if they've needed two or more courses of oral steroids a year, if they've needed to be in hospital more than once or attended a &E more than once. The, the guidance there suggests that if um, they are using or collecting more than six uh, salva a year, then that would be an indication for referral. Although, um, in you know, more than three saba a year in itself would indicate poor control. But we have to kind of come to a cutoff that is practical, and that's the kind of cutoff that's been agreed regionally. So that that's what we're going by at the moment. But anything more than three saba a year really is indicative of poor control. If the asthma control test is less than 20, again, that would be an indication that they have um, poorly controlled asthma and that would uh, um, trigger a referral. However, if you have safeguarding concerns, there are concerns about neglect or there are any other kind of psychosocial um, circumstances that make you think that you need to have a low, lower referral for um, lower threshold for referral, then, then that's absolutely fine. And obviously, if we're not sure about the diagnosis, then again, that would be a reason to refer to secondary care. Next slide, please. So I'll just finish off with a, a young man who um, I saw recently in the interest of confidentiality. I have changed his name to Max. Uh, so he was um, referred to me when he was 12 years old for suspected asthma. He was born at 38 weeks um, gestation. He was admitted very briefly to special care for oxygen, but was not ventilated. Mom describes that as a baby, he was always rattly. Um, he was diagnosed with tracheomalacia and um, was having frequent admissions to hospital up to the age of six. Because of that, um, 
he was on prophylactic septrin because of recurrent chest infections. And as a part of his diagnostic workup, there was also um, a sweat test which was normal and therefore excluded cystic fibrosis. He then improved at about eight years of age and was discharged from the tertiary center. Slide, please. Then at 11 years of age, unfortunately, he had COVID and was actually quite unwell with COVID, even though he didn't need hospital admission. Mom describes that he wouldn't be coming down for a couple of weeks and was very tired. And since that time, he has struggled with exercise more than normal. Although he will manage PE at school, he, he cannot uh, complete a football match, for example. Reported that he would wheeze with exercise when, and, and when walking his dogs, particularly if it was cold when he was walking them. He was worse at night, he would cough, but would not need to get up in the night to use his inhalers. He coughs and wheezes when he's uh, exposed to pollen. He uses his saba at least four times a week, despite being on flanil, 200 micrograms um, twice a day. He does have well controlled eczema and allergic rhinitis, and he also has a diagnosis of dyspraxia and dyslexia. And I've included that there just to again highlight the point that if we are discussing PAPs um, and giving them handwritten information, then being aware of those kind of difficulties and giving it in a format that they will understand is again important. Um, he does not have any food allergy. There is a family history of asthma in his mum and his grandma. Mum is a smoker and uh, there is um, mold in the property. Next slide, please. So on examination, um, he was obese with a BMI of 29, but otherwise his examination was normal. His peak flow was below expected for his height. His exhaled nitric oxide was normal, but he was on inhaled steroids. So I gave him a diagnosis of asthma, given that um, he had a history um, with multiple triggers, especially um, aeroallergens. He had a personal and family history of ATP, and he reported good response to SABA. What I felt were the triggers for him were mold, exercise, cold air, pollen, and viral illnesses. We did also discuss that perhaps there had been an element of long COVID that he was still recovering from. Next slide, please. So I changed him to serotide referred mom to a smoking cessation service and we are quite lucky at the QE because that's on site for us next to the pharmacy where they have to go and collect their prescriptions. So I encourage them very heavily to, to utilize the service. Um, I provided mom with a letter for the council to try and address um, the mold in the property. Our nurse practitioner did some education and, and went over a personalized asthma action plan and then I arranged a review for him in a couple of months. Next slide, please. During that time, he saw his GP with an asthma attack, but did not need to come to hospital, and he was changed to flutiform, which is a combination of fluticasone and formatrol, which actually he felt worked better. At the follow-up, then mom mentioned to me that uh, she had moved him outside of her house into grandma's house, which was more free, and he had improved significantly. But obviously that was not practical for them, but because for him to get to school, he would need to change buses and that just wouldn't work. And really, you know, a child shouldn't have to leave their family to go and live elsewhere just because they have asthma. Um, at that point, mum then showed me pictures of what the mold was in the property. And um, it was quite shocking and as bad as the pictures that I've shown you, if not worse. Next slide, please. Mum felt empowered enough to take the letter that given her to go to her local MP office. And on her way to, to the clinic, she received a call from the office offering her an appointment to come and try and move this forward. So I'm hoping that we will get a positive outcome there. Um, we plan to do some spirometry and skin prick testing when we see him next. I have discussed the possibility of trying him on a suitable mark regime, given that he had a good um, response to former troll or possibly unified and if it is worse in future. Although I feel that if we have to get to that, that it is quite regrettable because the obvious solution here is to try and get rid of the mold and put him in a good environment because mom has already tried that and it's worked. But if despite sustained improvement when he's in the right environment, his symptoms are, if there is no sustained improvement, sorry, um, once we have put him in, in, in the right environment, um, then I would consider referral to the tertiary centre, given that he has a background of airway malaysia and other things um, in the past. 
So the point I'm trying to make is obviously, despite everything, sometimes if you've tried everything and not quite getting the response that you want, then it is important then to review your diagnosis. And that should conclude my first talk. So in conclusion, asthma is a common chronic condition. A good history is key to diagnosis and management. We want to address triggers and comorbidities. We want to optimize preventive treatment and try and reduce the overuse of uh, SABA. There are up-to-date guidelines on the uh, Beat Asthma website, which we would be very keen for you to use. We have come up with referral guides and pathways that have been developed in collaboration with primary care. And again, please use, um, use them. Um, and if despite optimum treatment, there is no response, then you know, we do need to review the diagnosis. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ample. That's really, really helpful. Um, I think from the perspective of being able to share it in the way of using a case study to describe, I think that's really, really helpful. Um, now, I wonder whether or not I can't see anybody with any hands and there's nothing that we haven't responded to already in the chat. So I don't know. Oh, I can see some hands. Right. Paula Wright. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for, for um, children on MART, um, do you ever recommend prescribing a SABA as well for exacerbations um, or just um, sort of increasing the, the frequency of the, of the MART uh, therapy? And also, I, I was um, doing another online asthma module that talked about um, occasionally it being recommended that you provide a sort of rescue pack in the form of a inhaled corticosteroid with a spacer for exacerbations in in patients. Um, and and so is, is that something that's that's a common practice or recommended in children? So do you want me um, to take the nomination? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I would say is, so for self-management at home, they should be able to manage just with their MART treatment. But we do recommend that everybody has a, um, a SABA and MDI and spacer available so that if they do become acutely unwell, they can take that whilst they're getting to hospital or calling an ambulance or a waiting review. But we certainly, if you're using MART, you shouldn't be using your SABA regularly at home without a review. And there are MART specific management plans on the BTASMA website that very much leave the SABA into the red zone as well. And what about the, the rescue, um, uh, rescue inhaled corticosteroid with a space? Is that something that's just used in adults or is that sometimes used in children? No, it's not something we use in children. I mean, we do recognise that obviously if you're very tight and you're admitted, you may not be able to use your dry powder device adequately, but normally, you know, we'd assess that in hospital. So we, we don't use that at all in children. OK. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. We've got another chat, uh, another question in the chat here um, from Claire Smith. Um, could I ask about the validity of spirometry using an ICS, please? So I think normally touched on, you can have normal spirometry and it not exclude asthma. So it depends on the control of your asthma at the time. If you know, you're know you symptom free and you have normal spirometry, it doesn't exclude asthma. But equally, we all see patients on inhaled corticosteroids that aren't well controlled. And then again, you would ex expect normal spirometry or reversibility in keeping with that those symptoms. Great, thank you. And another question from the chat is in relation to the preference for spirometry and pheno to be performed on children in primary care or secondary care. I think by anybody who is skilled enough and confident enough to use it, um, you know, I'm lucky that we have a very experienced physiologist, but equally some practice nurses who, who do it regularly. Um, are ex experienced. And I think we are getting more and more referrals from older children who are being seen in, in diagnostic centres in the community. 
interesting point there that's come. Um, I use GINA guidance generally as it's more up to date. You know, I, I think which guidelines and, and which guidance you use are, are very debatable. Um, you know, I think GINA certainly in terms of using inhaled steroids with SABAs and not using SABAs alone is well ahead. And I think that's where asthma care will end up. Unfortunately, the inhalers aren't really there for children um, as yet. The question from Tamsin about Simbicort as Mart, I must say, I must apologise, we use um, Durus Spiromax, I can't remember if it's licensed or not, but it's a much easier inhaler to use than a turbo inhaler and lots of the slightly younger children find it better, but of course the dosing is slightly different than um, Simbicort. Thank you. Paula Wright, I don't know if that's a legacy hand. Sorry, yes, legacy hand. <laughs> I was just checking. Um, OK, um, so unless there's any more questions, I think time wise, we ought to perhaps move on. And um, so I wonder whether or not Dr. Moss, you could pick up and give the um, presentation about wheezing in under fives. Yeah, brilliant. If we can share the slides, please, Carol. And while we're waiting, if there's anybody who hasn't put their um, their role and where they're from in the chat, if you could do so, that we'd really appreciate that. So. Although this is very much about asthma, a lot of the questions that we've been asked as a group when we're out kind of spreading the word is about wheezing in preschool children. So we thought it would be important to um, include that in this um, webinar. I must say I am a tertiary respiratory paediatrician, so I'm aware that I have a very different role of practice to primary care. So please forgive me if I'm, you know, get the, the balance slightly wrong because I am aware we come from very different backgrounds. Next slide, please, Carol. So what I want to go through is a little bit of the background of um, wheeze in the under fives, a little bit about the definition of wheeze, although I'm aware that Nilmani's already touched on this, very briefly through the differential diagnosis and then the treatment and the basis for treatment. Next slide, please. So we know that one in th three children um, experience more, uh, more than one episode of wheeze by the age of three years. So it's incredibly common and 50% of children will have experienced at least one episode by the age of six years. Most of them are triggered with viral infections and it accounts for 0.15% of the UK healthcare budget, which if you think, oh, 0.15%, that doesn't seem that much. But when you think of what the overall budget is, that's not actually insignificant. Next slide, please. So many children with asthma have their first symptoms preschool and they'll often, you know, I'll often see them in my clinic and it's all oh, I've had symptoms since I was a baby, but we were told we couldn't pre be um, prescribed as asthma. Um, but certainly 50 percent of children are symptom free by five and 70 percent by the age of 10 and they're children that have had more than two episodes. Next slide, please. So wheeze is a continuous high pitched musical noise, which is usually during expiration. And it's a noise arising from the intrathoracic airways. One of the things I find very commonly in my clinic is that parents don't know how to describe respiratory noises. So they'll use wheeze to describe anything from wheeze, strider, ruttles, rattles. So it is really important that I think, especially in the preschool children, that you take a little bit of time just to hone down what they mean. And if you're any good at doing impressions of wheeze, sometimes that can be helpful. Next slide, please. So this is a busy slide with talking about the differential diagnoses, and we will go through a, a bit of it. Infections obviously are important. Some of them can be just recurrent viral infections. Chronic rhinosinusitis can cause wheeze, TB, HIV. There can be congenital problems, tracheomalacia or other airways malacia cystic fibrosis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease of um, prematurity, other congenital malformations, other causes of suppurative lung disease such as primary ciliary dyskinesia or immune deficiency and don't forget congenital heart disease can also present with wheezing. We do often see um, children with more mechanical problems so we see children with foreign body aspiration and gastroesophageal reflux and I definitely see some children that present with true asthma before the age of five. Next slide, please. 
So bronchitis, as you know, is incredibly common. It often follows a viral infection and can be waxing and waning. It may be persistent, especially over the winter months and especially in children in nurseries. And I think it's really important in the history that you try and wheeze that out. They might have a lot of nighttime cough and an exertional cough, but the cough is often rattly and the child is often chesty and rattly. And again, this teasing out what's a wheeze and what's a rattle can be really important for these um, diagnoses. They don't tend to have the acute attacks like children with true wheeze and bronchoconstriction do. It tends to be more they get a viral illness and then they just get this cough that won't go away or persists for quite a while. And the child is often generally otherwise well in themselves. They're normally eating, playing, although this is often quite trying for the parents. It causes a lot of sleepless nights for everybody. Next slide, please. Um, if we think about a little bit about ex preterm infants, many of them do wheeze with viral infection and many of them do have chronic wheeze. They do tend to wheeze more when they're hypoxic. So I think if you've got a, an ex prem who's persistently wheezing, it's worth referring them back to hospital. Some do settle with in, inhaled corticosteroids, but the pathology is definitely different to asthma and definitely different to other preschool wheezers. And it probably reflects the underlying small airway calibre. And of course, there may be other problems. So we do see some exprems with undiagnosed subglottic stenosis and it quite be, can quite be, be quite severe. And some of them, if we do a bronchoscopy, you see these irregularities in the airways, which we think are probably due to um, injuries from recurrent suctioning when the children have been intubated and ventilated as newborns. Next slide, please. Foreign body aspiration, if you don't think about it, you won't diagnose it. So always ask in any child who's able to use their hands when present with some onset respiratory distress. And especially if you're hearing a focal wheeze or you've got focal chest signs, it's really important to think about it. If there's stride or think about it and refer all children with a positive history. We work very closely with the ear, nose and throat surgeons in Newcastle with children with suspected foreign body. And I personally think if I'm if the children I take to theatre, if at least a third of them um, have a negative examination, I'm probably not looking at enough because there's always some children who you're not sure about. It's not in the history and then you find something. Next slide. So I haven't talked about the separative causes because I would hope you're all familiar with that and I hope that they would all kind of um, ring some alarm bells to trigger referral. But it is interesting when you think about the epidemiology of early wheeze and there's been lots and lots of work with this. And the interesting thing is every time you see a new paper, it changes slightly. So people have tried to split them into groups. They've talked about the early transient wheezers, the non-atopic wheezers and the Ig E associated wheeze or asthma. And what you can see for every group can spill over into the other groups. So although you may be an early transient wheezer, you may also have non-atopic wheeze. A non-atopic wheezer may then also become an IgE associated wheeze or an asthma. So every time you see a child, even if they've previously had a diagnosis, you just need to bear this in mind. And the Tucson study gave us this information about 50% um, wheezing by six years of age. And most of them, about a fifth, it's a transient viral wheeze. They don't have ATP. They do have lower lung function as infants when you do infant lung function testing, but they do grow out of it and things get better. About a sixth are more persistent and they start with viral wheeze. They were found to have an elevated cord Ig, so that suggests a maternal history of ATP. And then about a sixth again have late onset wheeze. Next slide, please. So in this group, inflammation is poorly studied and may be absent. And I think this is important when we're thinking about treatment and management um, of the preschool wheeze as well. And the causative factors vary from child to child. And as I said, for an individual, they can vary over time. So one child you can have that it's very much viruses in the first few years that cause triggers. But then as they get a little bit older, you might find that hay fever or dust is a trigger as well. Next slide, please. So the ERS um, formed a task force to look at the definition, assessment and treatment of weeding disorders in preschool children. And this was hoping to have an evidence based approach. 
Next slide, please. And you'll see a lot of these studies I'm talking about are relatively old. And I think some of this is because it's so hard to study. And again, there are massive changes. So ERS did have review that original um, 2002 paper in 2008. Next slide. So they came up with the classification of episodic and they found viruses, particularly rhinovirus, coronavirus, RSV, human metanuma virus, paraflu and adenovirus caused it. Multiple trigger, they found smoking was a really big factor, but also air allergens. But the update very much recognises, as we've been saying, that things aren't clear cut and the frequency and severity are much better predictors of whether this is going to be a persistent problem or not. Next slide, please. So treatment, I think this is the big area we can talk about it, but it's when you've got the child in front of you and the parents, how are you going to manage this child? Next slide. So smoking cessation for family members, I think this is incredibly dif difficult. Families are often resistant, as Nilmani said, they always smoke outside, never in front of the child, and it's hard to persuade. And I certainly, whenever I meet a family for the first time, I discuss smoking with them. I think there's a limit as to how many times you can go over it, but if the child is getting severe problems, I certainly reiterate this. And definitely if I can smell smoke on the family in clinic, and especially in COVID times when we're all in surgical masks, if you can smell smoking, that child is getting a significant second and third hand load. Care education is really important. And I think this is the same way that for actual asthma, it's really important that the family are empowered to manage the children to recognise things um, and what to do. And we save a lot of hospital admissions by doing this. Beta 2 agonists often are affected, and there's evidence to show that an MDI and spacer are more effective than a nebulizer. They decrease the need for admission and they end up in a quicker recovery time. I remember early on in my career when there wasn't as much MDI and spacers, and you used to do a paediatric on call, and you'd have a ward full of children that had come in in the evening, and by the morning they were all charging round absolutely crazy from the salbutamol. And it's so nice that we don't see that anymore. Next slide. Spacer devices, so most children under the age of four years need to use a face mask. I must say, I actually prefer the um, flow view aero chambers, so the orange and yellow ones, and most children prefer them. If you're using the large volume spacer with the mask, which is the first picture, you do need to have it at an angle so that um, the valve sits open. It's really important that small children should not be held or forced to have an inhaler. Once you start doing that, it's really difficult to get the children to take the inhalers. So we'll often, if we see the children in clinic, give the parents a couple of spaces so that the children can play with them and get used to them and not be as invasive when they see them. I, I do you know, appreciate it's not always easy, especially when they're acutely unwell but we do use as much diversional um, therapy as we can. And it's surprising how far you can get by putting a spacer on a teddy and kind of moving things that way, putting the spacer on the tummy and moving it up. And sticker reward charts can be surprisingly useful for the preschool children as well. Next slide. So the advantages of spacers, you get much better um, drug deposition. You don't need much coordination because it acts as a holding chamber. So the large particles are deposited in the chamber rather than the mouth and the throat, but we still advise the patients to have a drink or clean their teeth after using their steroid inhaler if they're on inhaled steroids. And if using a face mask, you've got to remember that you can get drug deposition around the face and you should wipe the child's face after use. Um, and NICE have published guidelines on the recommendation for inhaler devices under five and for children aged five to 15, which you should all be aware of. Next slide, please. Um, I won't go through this too much because I know um, next week's webinar will cover this, but it is important that you shake the inhaler before use. You insert it to the end of the spacer. The child starts breathing and you insert one puff at a time. The child then should take four to five breaths or count to 10, depending on the size of the spacer and how tachypneic they are. You do need to wait between actuations. The um, aerosol part of the, the MDI cools down and you can't be guaranteed drug delivery if you don't wait and then you repeat. So if you take 10 puffs, it can take you several minutes to do that. Next slide, please. 
so as I said, it's really important to encourage self-management. Next slide. Um, we have a, a management plan very similar to the personalised asthma action plans that are split into green, amber and red. Um, it is obviously slightly different. So in the green zone, when your child's starting to be unwell um, with viral induced wheeze, so if they start sh with symptoms and you have an inhaler, sh you should give them two puffs through the space or up to every four hours until improvement. Um, and for lots of children, that's all that's required. And it's parents know that they, knowing that they can initiate that. It's safe to do it for about three days as long as the child isn't getting worse. And if after this time the child's much the same, then we'd recommend that they make an appointment to make sure we're not missing a diagnosis. Next slide. So when the amber zone and the child's more unwell, so then we recommend that they give two to six puffs up to four hourly, but again, recommend that they make an appointment to see a doctor within the next 24 hours or attend out of hours. And then if we move on to the next slide, if they've had six puffs of salbutamol or it's less than two hours after they had six puffs and they need it again, or they've got hard and fast breathing, we're using a lot of effort, difficult to talk, obviously colour change, then we're very much in the red zone and that's when they should be um, seeking emergency help. And what we recommend whilst you're waiting for emergency help is that you give continuous salbutamol one puff at a time as they've been taught until help arrives. And obviously we do encourage the family as much as possible to stay calm and try and keep the child calm. Next slide. So that's kind of the acute management. And then there's a lot of question, especially with the um, recurrent wheezes as to management. In held steroids, there is some evidence of benefit in multiple trigger wheeze, but I think it's quite hard to pick the child. It's certainly not as beneficial as in school age children. And if you think back to that slide I showed originally with the different curves of where you fit, it's picking out which area the child's in. There is a dose response curve and there is marked individual variation and there's certainly very little evidence in children under two years. A family history of asthma does increase the chance of response, but not a family history of ATP. And there are, of course, the concerns about impaired growth and other side effects if you're giving very high doses. Next slide. So there has been a Cochrane review by one of my colleagues looking at inhaled steroids for episodic viral induced wheeze. Next slide. And what you can see here is inhaled steroids for episodic and viral induced wheeze of maintenance therapy versus um, placebo. Actually, there isn't an effect at all. Those both of those plots are right on the middle of the chart to show that there's no difference between placebo and inhaled steroids. Next slide. This slide here is looking at inhaled steroids for episodic viral wheeze of childhood when you've had more than two um, episodes versus placebo. And this is looking at exacerbations requiring emergency room visits. And there's possibly a slight move to um, favouring steroids, but you'll agree it's a very small effect and it certainly doesn't make me think, oh, this is a wonder drug, we should be giving it to everybody who presents with viral induced wheeze. Next slide. So episodic high dose and held corticosteroids do provide a partially effective strategy for the treatment of mild episodic viral wheeze of childhood. But I, I don't think it's enough. It's certainly not something I do regularly in my practice because it's not convincing and the number needed to treat is relatively high. There's no current evidence to favour maintenance, low dose and held corticosteroids and prevention and management of episodic mild viral induced wheeze. So certainly I wouldn't expect lots of preschool children in your practice to be um, prescribed in health steroids. Next slide. So this is a, a systematic review of um, inhaled corticosteroids, which is more recent um, in preschoolers with recurrent wheezing and asthma. If we go into the next slide. That included 29 studies and did show that there were less weeding, wheezing episodes in steroid group. But again, the number needed to treat was seven. So it's quite a high number of children needed to treat. And this just looked at wheezing episodes. It didn't look at the severity of them. Next slide. Um, they've also looked at um, a regime of daily or intermittent high dose 
budesonide and have found no difference in the daily low dose and the high dose big hit um, during exacerbations. Um, so again, thinking it's not really beneficial. Next slide. So there's then some work looking at oral prednisolone for preschool children with acute viral induced wheeze. Um, this was done by a team in London. Next slide. It was double blind RCT. It was well designed. There were 687 children aged 10 months to five years. They were enrolled um, at hospital admission after the first dose of bronchodilators and they find there was no duration difference in the duration of hospitalization, interval between episodes, salbutamol use or seven day symptom score. Next slide. Just before we talk about Monte Lucas, I think really the, the evidence is pointing that in most preschool wheezers, oral steroids and inhaled steroids are probably not beneficial. So Monte Lucas does have some evidence to show that it's beneficial in multiple trigger wheeze, and certainly there's some nice Australian studies that show it's useful in viral induced wheeze. It decreases episodes over one year, but with a number needed to treat of 12. And sometimes we use it at the onset of cold and it, that results in a reduction in unscheduled healthcare visits, but no reduction in hospitalisation, duration of the episode or use of other therapies. In my practice, certainly we find that lots of families find the side effects of Monte Lucas quite intru um, intrusive. Behavioural problems can be quite significant and night terrors. I know when I tried mycin on it for viral induced wheeze, the amount of sleep disturbance we had from the night terrors was much worse than the intermittent sleep disturbance we had um, from the viral induced wheeze. Next slide, please. So ipratropium bromide, it's something that I think is quite an old fashioned therapy. It's been shown to be beneficial in older children. There's no evidence of benefit in preschool children, but it does have minimal side effects. But again, I don't think this is something that should be routinely prescribed for children to have at home for preschool wheeze. Next slide. So in my practice, we give preventive treatment if there's regular symptoms or severe exacerbations. And certainly I would be very happy if you had these children for them to be referred to us prior to giving um, inhaled steroids. I think you really need to think about the side effects um, when you're choosing which treatment to try. And the most important thing is that they do have a trial off. As we've seen that these children do improve with time. So just because you give a treatment and the child improves, you don't know if that's a result of the treatment you've prescribed or just time. So if you have a trial off and the symptoms don't recur, it's probably just time. Whereas if you have a trial off and the symptoms recur, that treatment was probably being effective. Next slide. So in summary, it's a common problem. In most cases, it has a good prognosis. Most children grow out of it. Treatment should very much be um, based around education, smoking advice, bronchodilators with an action plan that's well explained and possibly add on treatment of inhaled corticosteroids or Monte Lucas, or as I said, referral to secondary care. If treatment doesn't work, stop and reevaluate. Certainly in this preschool group, I don't think there should be increasing um, escalation of treatment without a referral. Next slide. And that's just time for questions. I can see I haven't monitored the chat, but I can see there are a few questions there. Great. Thanks, Dr. Moss. There's um, sorry, I've got a bit of an echo there. Um, there are a couple of questions here from Paula Wright and Annie Hall. Um, so I wonder if it might be helpful. To, I'm just conscious of time now. It's it's nearly five past seven. So I think it would be helpful if you maybe picked up those few questions um, from the colleagues. And then if, if Dr. Ramphill could pick up and deliver the presentation that we have planned for the, the hot topics and top tips. So just while we're waiting for the slides, I don't advocate at all the increasing of inhaled steroids. The evidence for it isn't great and certainly um, most of the children improve um, earlier. I think the question about giving Monte Lucas earlier to reduce nighttime terrors, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I think it's a discussion you can have with the family and, and indeed a trial. Sorry, Normani, you've got your slides now. That's OK. So I think if we can just move to the third slide, because that's we've done the introductions 
So we're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, topics that are, um, you know, um, being discussed in, in the asthma world currently. Um, so if we go to slide three, Louise has already mentioned um, in her introduction that we have been doing quite a bit of work to promote the National Asthma um, Bundle. I don't think my slides are moving there, but if we go to slide three. Yep, so just to make you aware that that was published in September 2021 and we are um, hoping that there will be um, new versions of it soon. Um, we've had quite a few presentations at uh, GP Tito's in particular um, to talk about the bundle, so we won't be talking too much about it today. Um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, essentially what the bundle talks about is that we look at this as a whole system approach, um, focus on organization of care and leadership, discuss environmental impacts, focus a bit more on acute, accurate and early diagnosis, good prevention, manage exacerbations, um, develop services for severe asthma, focus on training and education, and also um, utilize data and, and link in with uh, um, partners in terms of data. Um, next slide, please. So what can we do to improve asthma care? I think we've already kind of touched on some of those um, um, areas, but essentially addressing the overuse of uh, SABA is, is a main area of interest for, for us. And I think a, a big message that we want to send out today that overuse of SABA is uh, an indication of poor control. It does increase the risk of hospitalization and ideally we, do, we would like them not to have to use more than three a year. We want to encourage the use of a preventer. We know that the use of a preventer does reduce the risk of death and we want to focus and, and, and make sure that they're using the inhaler correctly. And uh, it's really very much kind of a little bit of investment short term for long term gain. So if they've got poor inhaler technique, then they will not be getting the, the drug treatment that they need. Um, there will be a lot of overuse and wastage of medication. And uh, whilst we can teach people when we see them, often we know that they don't always retain everything that's been sent in a, con in a consultation. So it is important to signpost them to um, resources that will then support them um, once they get home. So we would signpost them to videos on the Beat Asthma website, which are quite um, easy to understand and uh, and very helpful. So next slide, please. Um, so you will see there that the Beat Asthma website um, has got several resources. It's for primary care, secondary care, families. It has videos. It has lots of resources on air pollution, for example. And right at the top, you'll also see a sign that says English, and it does have these resources in a few other languages as well, which again, it's very helpful. And similarly, we have got the beta anaphylaxis logo on our beta asthma website, because as we've already touched again, asthma and anaphylaxis and allergies and food allergies will often go hand in hand. Next slide, please. So there is very much an agenda for us to try and make respiratory care greener. Uh, we know that the NHS contributes to four to seven percent of, of UK emissions and the, um, the ambition from um, from the NHS is to try and reduce that by um, 80% um, from by 2028 to 2032 and then to get to net zero in 2040. Um, it is important, however, to stress that if somebody is, when we're talking about this with patients, that it is important that they do not stop using the medication because they want to become more environmental friendly. So if they need the medication, obviously they need the medication. So the focus for us is to try and get them well controlled so that they do not need to use this ABA very frequently. Um, as we know, the MDIs do contain fluorinated gases in the propellant and they are much more potent than carbon dioxide in terms of uh, pollution. Um, they account for about 3% of NHS emissions Dry powdered inhalers are much more environmental friendly because they do not contain propellant gases, but they're often not suitable for young children. And if we do use them, then we will use them 
usually in young people who are 12 years and over. And even then, it is important to make sure that they can master the technique before we prescribe uh, them dry powder inhalers. Next slide, please. We can choose a more environmental friendly formulation. For example, Salamol will be more environmental friendly than Ventolin. Um, reducing this above the use, as we keep stressing, will be what will be the biggest impact in terms of, of making um, respiratory care greener. Um, we would advise that you prescribe by brand, because again, if you prescribe by, by brand, um, often they are less polluting the formulations that, uh, that are there. And sometimes that does require shift in thinking, because obviously when we've been to medical school, we're always taught to prescribe uh, generic medications, but that's different when it comes to things like inhalers. Um, if we're using a, a, an MDI, then for example, if they are using clenil 50 and they're needing two puffs, then perhaps switch to clenil 100 and only one puff, and that again would be less polluting. And the other important message is that the MDIs are then returned to pharmacy because that's where they can be disposed of safely. If they are put in the recycling bin or in the normal bin at home, then unfortunately they will end up in landfills and they will continue to release propellant gases even when we think that they are empty. So most many patients and many of the families I see certainly do not know that they can return the inhalers to pharmacy. Um, but we should encourage them to return their inhalers to pharmacy for safe disposal. Next slide, please. So this is just really to uh, stress the point that we've made about the different um, devices, the different um, formulations are um, different in terms of carbon footprint. And if you look at Salamol there, it says 10. And if you look at uh, Ventolin, it's 28. So um, in families who are willing to change then, and most of them are willing to change, it is worth um, changing to a Salamol um, inhaler. Some people sometimes will say that they can feel a bit of a taste and if they don't tolerate it, then fair enough, they can go back on their Ventolin. But certainly a lot of the families I see are quite happy to change and then stay on Salamol. Next slide, please. So we've already again touched a little bit on MART. I haven't really spent a lot of time on that because as we've said, it is more commonly used in adults. And for those um, children and young people who are on MART, generally they will be seen in secondary care and often also seen in tertiary care. It requires, as you know, a combination of an inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta-2 agonist. Usually it will be formatrol base, and um, what we tend to find that they are on is uh, Foster or Symbicort, as you've already mentioned, but as Sam mentioned, so Symbicort is not the easiest to use sometimes for young people as it is a turbo inhaler. Important again to stress that Ceratide or Combisal are not used as MART and many of the other combination inhalers are not licensed as MART. It does have to contain a long-acting beta-2 agonist that is fast-acting. Next slide, please. So I think the focus is that we want to try and achieve good drug delivery. And as Sam has said uh, again, um, you know, we have moved away from using nebulizers all the time and, and using spacer because there is good drug delivery. But equally, if we do find lots of people who present to clinic who are told or who have picked them somewhere that, uh, you know, if they are old enough, then they can use the inhalers directly um, in the mouth. That is something that we wouldn't advocate at all. Without a spacer, even with the best technique, only around 20% of the dose will get to the lungs most will remain in the oropharynx. And we also know that if you use a space, then it will reduce unwanted side effects, such as hoarseness and oral frush. And usually spaces will allow children to get their medication in whilst they are breathing normally. So the right inhaler for the patient is one that they're going to use and they're going to use correctly. When we deal with adolescents, often we again know that they don't carry their spaces and they won't be using them and there might be a variety of reasons for that. So, you know, it is worthwhile always trying to find a device that they might carry with them and salbutamol easy breathe or salbutamol easy healer, for example, might be one that suits them or a Ventolin Aki healer. Uh, but again, as Sam has mentioned, we would still advocate that you prescribe a Saba with um, an MDI with a spacer for acute asthma attacks, because if they are really unwell, 
and they may not have um, the effort to, to be able to um, use a dry powder inhaler and, and uh, get better from that. Next slide, please. So concordance, a major issue for us, um, as I've mentioned, um, you know, more often than not, when I see patients in clinic, they will admit that they are not using their, their inhalers or they are not using their spaces. So non-adherence, particularly in adolescents, is, is a major issue. So we aim for concordance, and that obviously is a two-way um, is a two-way agreement, if you want, between yourself and, and the patient and their families. Um, so we want to agree on a on a PAP and one that they will utilize and that will work. So I would always ask whether they're using their preventers and how often they are missing them. And I think, you know, if you ask directly and sensitively, people will give you an honest answer. If they're not using it, it's important to know why they are not using it. Some children will tell you that they, they, they're embarrassed to use it in school. They do not want to look different. Um, so in the, that sort of situation, you want to change to something that is perhaps less bulky. So an easy healer or uh, would perhaps be more appropriate. Some of them will admit that they just forget really, and they haven't quite thought about when they need to um, to have it, and they don't really have a routine in terms of, of uh, when they take their inhalers. So you want to try and tie it with a regular activity. And if they're brushing their teeth, that's great. You can tie it to that. If they're not brushing their teeth, then it's a little bit more difficult. And increasingly, I encourage teenagers to put a reminder on their phones because they like that. Uh, you know, they like apps. They like uh, tech. So, so that works well for them. Um, next slide, please. So we have mentioned a lot about smoking. Um, and whilst we don't want to kind of, um, you know, dismantle the message about vaping, which we understand is an important um, step for adults who are trying to stop smoking. I think it is important to um, stress that it's not harmless. And um, unfortunately, in young people, it's, it's viewed as very trendy and something that they do longer term rather than just a stepping stone from stopping smoking. Um, so if you want to hear more about it, there is a video by a um, doctor called Seb Gray. If you just Google it and uh, you will have the slides, so you'll have the reference that uh, was circulated as part of the Ask About Asthma campaign, in, um, which tends to happen around September time every year. And he goes into all the details of how um, it's, you know, it's just not safe, not harmless uh, for young people. And I think really the vaping epidemic is perhaps a time bomb that's waiting to explode for young people, um, in my opinion. Um, smoking, as we've mentioned um, again and again, is something that we want to address and try. And, and, you know, in some cases it does work. I've just had a young girl in clinic last week who told me that she was smoking 40 cigarettes a day. Sorry, 40 cigarettes a week. She's only 15. Um, and with some work, she has managed to come down to three a week. So um, we do have some success stories, so I think it's worth the effort. Um, next slide, please. We want to ask a little bit about the immunization and encourage them to take up the flu vaccine. And again, we take this opportunity quite often to discuss the COVID vaccine as well and, and see whether they would want to take that. Um, next slide, please. A lot of work is currently happening in schools, as uh, we do know that that's often an area where um, young people will not feel quite as safe if they have asthma. Um, so there are pilots already happening in some schools in the area where we will be looking at perhaps doing some of the asthma reviews um, in school, because again, we know from having done surveys earlier um, last year, that uh, although sometimes families are invited to an annual review, many of them do not take up um, the offer. So perhaps trying to get them in a setting where they already are um, might uh, increase that uptake of an annual review. Um, there's already a pilot that's running from the network with several schools across the ICB um, in trying to implement an asthma friendly accreditation framework. We encourage families to share their PAP with school 
and if the, the staff is confident with managing their exacerbations, then again, as we mentioned, you know, young people often will feel safer. And it also delivers that kind of message of consistency. They've shared their PAP and the staff is confident in managing their symptoms in school. Next slide, please. So other, uh, other important point I think is would be to have good links with your pharmacist colleagues. They are incredibly helpful people and they can monitor collection of prescriptions. They can identify SABA overuse. And if you have a mechanism to link in with your pharmacist as to how to identify SABA use, then you, know, you can trigger reviews um, more promptly um, and address that problem um, very effectively. Um, they can, for example, also monitor whether the preventers are being collected and um, again, help with triggering asthma reviews. In some practices, um, pharmacists are also doing some of the asthma reviews. Next slide, please. And we also know that the post uh, acute attacks, um, there is a recommendation from the BTS guidance that um, they have a 48 hour review. And um, the, the point of that is to try to identify those who are not improving. So again, pharmacists may be able to help in, in that area. We know there is a big problem there, mainly because of the capacity, it's not easy to deliver um, that sort of target. Um, but it is an important part of care because it gives us the opportunity to perhaps also see them slightly outside of the acute episode and identify whether the attack has been triggered by anything that is modifiable. Um, we have new winning plans now that have been implemented. Whilst previously we were advocating 10 puffs of uh, Saudi small every four hours, that's now changed and we would say up to six puffs. And if they are continuing to use that, then they would need an urgent review. The point of that is not to miss those children who are not improving um, as there have sadly been um, you know, adverse events as a result of uh, children being discharged and then not improving and not representing to hospitals. Um, we also want to encourage the use of peak flows where possible. Usually, as we said, five years and above you want to try, but often they might be a little bit older before they can use it correctly. And uh, again, on the new weaning plans uh, that I will come to, there is um, there is the weaning plan and there's also some um, instructions on how to use peak flows because when used correctly, they are quite helpful and used in conjunction with symptoms will help them to recognize and manage their deterioration early. Next slide, please. Yep, so that's the new asthma um, weaning plans that you will find on the Beat Asthma website with all the instructions and then instructions on how to use the peak flow. Next slide, please. And uh, just to reiterate that this is part of uh, several um, kind of education um, events that we are promoting, but really what we would really encourage is that people go and do the full training, which is on e-learning for help. And um, that will give you the different tiers of training. I would suspect most people who are in primary care um, who are on, on the call today would probably fit into tier three as um, you are prescribing and seeing patients face to face. But next slide, please. But this goes into um, the different tiers um, that are there. So, you know, if you have minimal contact, you may just be in tier one and there are different um, levels of training offered depending on what your involvement is with um, patients who suffer from asthma. Next slide. So just to thank everyone for attending today. And if you have any further questions, if um, we'll try and answer them in the next five minutes or so. There are a few questions in the chat um, that Dr. Moss has been picking up. And I wonder whether you might be able to have a look, Dr. Ramphal. In the meantime, is there any specific feedback where, from colleagues who might want to actually ask any additional questions? There's no hands that I can see at the moment. There's a question here um, from Townsend Smith in the chat. 
um, the, which states, if overusing Subba and refusing to attend face-to-face -face review despite many attempts, do you stop prescribing? Any other tips for getting them in? So I was just typing a reply to that one. And, and what I would say is, I think it's really hard because we don't want children to be without Sabbas, but equally it, it clearly is dangerous for them uh, to have so many. I I know what some practices have done have kind of made a concerted effort that when they come to collect the prescription, try and have someone free. The other thing I think is, you know, if, if they are refusing and they're having that many Sabbas, if you spelled out to them why there are problems, it's a safeguarding issue. Um, you know, non-attendance for review is a safeguarding issue and I think it needs to be escalated um, through that barrier. The other um, thing, there were similar comments before, I think the community pharmacist can be really helpful here because with the electronic prescribing, even if they don't come into the GP surgery, they will have contact with the pharmacist where they um, collect that. So the next question, just looking, there is no role for nebulizers in the community. So um, nebulizers should only be given with oxygen and if that's the case they should be in hospital or on their way to hospital. There may be the very very odd child who for some reason can't manage an MDI in spaces so if they're severely autistic or something like that but equally you need to think about the preventive treatment because if they can't take their reliever treatment adequately via um, a spacer they're not going to be able to take the preventive treatment so I'd be really um, careful with that. Thank you. There's a helpful suggestion there from one of the participants who suggested a telephone call to families where pair, where children aren't brought to a, if they've missed an appointment. Um, well, I suppose that's a, a perhaps a top tip about how you might get them in and encourage their participation. Um, and another um, point that's been raised um, by Paula Wright, um, suggesting making contacts and engaging with NIAS around training to their clinical assessment service. And um, we are actually in discussion currently with um, NIAS and uh, are furthering that line of inquiry. So hopefully we can provide some assurances there. Um, is there anything else from anybody? I'm just conscious of time. We've got four minutes and I, I was hopeful just at the end of the session just to kind of close up, round up and provide a few um, further snippets of information. So are we Louise, happy? Just one last point I, I want to make is, uh, as Sam has said that, you know, if they are not picking up their prescriptions and not um, attending, then obviously that's a safeguarding um, uh, um, issue. But also perhaps, um, you know, just establish whether that number that we are counting is the correct number, because sometimes people will be issued different inhalers for different households. And also sometimes there is um, a prescription of a SABA that is generated automatically if they're picking up their preventer. So we just need to make sure also that we've got the information correct, um, that they're not, we're not counting a lot of inhalers, that they're actually not being used. So I think just leading on from that, Nilmini, salbutamol shouldn't be routinely um, prescribed with the inhaled yeah. steroids, and that, that yeah. is what I think yeah. for patients. And equally, at the start of a diagnosis, a child may need four inhalers or whatever, one for school, one for dad, one for granny, one for home. They shouldn't need that many every month because they shouldn't be using that. So again, it should be on and as required. Can, just before we hand back to Louise, can I just say thank you all for coming, but please, I'm very aware that when we do things like this, we're very much talking to the interested. So please try and um, talk to your less interested colleagues about childhood asthma and point them to the resources and try and get some more interest. Thank you. Thanks. Great, Dr. Moss. Fantastic. If I could just have my final slide, um, Carol. Um, I guess this just brings us to a close, really, and I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody um, for giving up your time on the Monday evening um, to participate in our webinar um, and also to our ASPA leadership group and team members for putting slide packs together and obviously for, to support, for, for the support in facilitating this event. So we hope that the session has been really, really helpful. And as I say, we're going to continue to pick out the questions and queries from the chat and obviously monitor this for 24 hours following in case you come back to it and think that there was something else you might like to have asked. Um, the slide on the screen at the moment will be shared and it contains a number of links. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the Healthier Together resources that are available. Um, and in particular, I would like to make reference to the TRIPT work, which stands for 
tackling respiratory illness in poverty together. Um, this follows the Institute of Health Equity report about fuel poverty um, and the Child's Health and Wellbeing Network has undertaken some work to support professionals with navigation through the resources that are available, um, especially to families who may have additional vulnerability. Um, and this provides some key information and guidance for professionals. There's a link on there to the Healthy Together website, which points you in the right direction. Um, we would very much um, like to invite yourselves and obviously the, the, the opportunity of sharing um, the, the invite to the webinar too, which is planned for the, the 9th of February at 6pm. This is obviously more aimed at practice nurses um, and pharmacists and anyone else who regularly de delivers asthma reviews. Um, so the link is to register is there. Uh, we've got a short recorded presentation um, that's available. It's 12 minutes long. Um, so for those people who just want a small introduction, short introduction, that might be a helpful link to um, share within your practices locally. Um, essentially, it gives an introduction to the National Asthma Care Bundle um, and signposts to the available resources. I've included on the link, and I know Dr. Ramphill referred to it in her slide deck, um, but I've included the link to the eLearning for Health platform, which includes the links to all of the various levels, as we've suggested that people within this forum forum or the, this audience might be looking more at the level three um, a tier training option that's available there. Um, I'd also like to take this time to be able to um, advertise the, or advise colleagues of the opportunity um, to be part of our Paediatric Asthma Network Panic, uh, NEPAC, NECPAC conference. Sorry, get my acronyms in right there. It's the Northeastern Cumbria Paediatric Asthma and Allergy Conference. Um, it's something that's being sort of hosted and led by um, the Paediatric Asthma Network. Um, it will be held on the 6th of June at the Fed in Gateshead. Um, that there's all sorts of opportunities and um, the, the conference itself is, is aimed at the, the wider system, including health, education and social care colleagues um, and with the aims of reducing avoidable um, harm from asthma um, improving quality of life and sort of supporting and establishing the whole system approach. Um, we plan for um, conference style events followed by a series of workshops. Participants can choose four or seven workshops. It looks to be a really exciting day um, and the link um, to to join up, uh, sign up for that is, is there. Um, so that's it really. Um, I think that it's a huge privilege to have people here staying on a Monday night. So thank you very much um, to, to colleagues and everyone for their time. Um, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the Child Health and Wellbeing Network and obviously our asthma leadership group. Night all. Stop the recording. Thank you, Louise. Stop recording.